Um, so I'm A.B. Boyles from the Office of Health Assessment and Translation. But this project that I'm going to talk to you about today has really been a cross-NTP effort. Uh, we've tried to put a lot of people's heads together from pathology, biomolecular screening, um, tox branch, of course, um, as well as NTP labs. So some of the work is actually going to be done here in the building. Um, so it's really been a group effort. I'm just the one up here today. So I'm going to give you some background on the topic of artificial turf, synthetic turf, crumb rubber. Uh, it goes by lots of different names. Um, we've actually had a hard time narrowing it down to something short and sweet. Uh, our preliminary literature, literature summary, as well as uh, fill you in on some other efforts by OEHA, which is one of the groups in Cal EPA, and some federal efforts. And then I'm going to lay out for you in some broad strokes the NTP research program plan. Uh, we're going through some feasibility considerations right now, so there's not going to be a lot of we are going to do X, Y, and Z, because we're still trying to figure out what's going to be feasible and, and possible with this material, as well as the next steps and where do we go from here. So we usually talk about substances of concern, but turf is not one thing, and it's not one substance, and as Scott alluded to, it's inherently variable. Um, so the turf itself that's used as playing fields is uh, there's like a carpet kind of backing with grass-like blades, um, usually made of some sort of plastic. And in between those blades to provide the cushioning is some sort of infill. And most of these fields, it's recycled tires. So it's cr crumb rubber, as that's called. Um, these are passenger car vehicle tires that have been ground up and used as that cushioning material. Um, it's used in both indoor and out outdoor facilities. Obviously, you can't grow grass indoors, so this enables um, people to play indoors in all weather. Uh, adults and children play on this, the fields, um, but they also complain that the crumb rubber can sort of stick to them. It goes home with them in their hair, on their skin, in their clothes. Uh, just talk, goalies talk about eating turf because they dive into it so much. Um, and so that's why that we, um, we're looking at this. But Keep in mind, this is a big mixture. If we say crumb rubber, which is what we're going to start off testing, it's the stuff in between the blades. Uh, we're, there are p multiple potential routes of exposure, and we honestly don't know which of these is most, most concern. Um, so like I said, it's their skin contact, obviously. Um, so this could be substances bound to the rubber, um, gets onto the skin. It, it could be ingested. These are fairly small particles, but you'd notice if you actually ate it. Um, although we've got children, so they're hand to mouth. My daughter ate sand, so you know, it's possible to eat this, as well as inhalation of respirable particles, um, semi-volatile and volatile organic compounds are known to come off of the fields, um, so people can be inhaling those. Um, but we don't know which of these, this is the primary, we don't know which constituent is going to be the, the highest or of the most concern for potential health effects. It's also very likely that the exposure profile will change over the life of the field. So especially ones that are outdoors getting UV rays, heat, rain, the particles can break down. The, so the distribution of the particulate matter will probably change, but we don't really know. Um, the volatile composition could change. They also get refurbished. So as the, the crumb either goes home with people or washes away, they have to be put back in. Um, and so the, the fields and the exposure is going to change. Uh, so Scott very well outlined our nominations process. And for this topic, we actually had three different requests come into NTP. So the first was a nomination for private citizen to Office of Health Assessment and Translation for a literature analysis. Um, this was someone who lived near a turf field and his neighbor had blood cancer. Um, and so he just thought that residents, schools should have better information about potential risks. Um, then we got a, a formal request from OEHA to do short-term toxicity testing in order to complement one of their research efforts. Um, and they really wanted something available in 18 months so that they could consider it in their overall um, effort. And then we most recently got a nomination for, from a private citizen. This one was a little more specific, um, asking for a cancer bioassay, specifically of crumb rubber, and, and emphasize the inhalation route and also wanting us to do a better job of characterizing what was in the crumb rubber. Um, so this is sort of the order I'm going to go through in uh, the next couple slides. So first talking about that literature summary we did. There are actually very few human health studies. The most of the published studies on turf are of per sports performance. So how fast did people run on turf versus grass? There's a lot of on injuries. So concussions, ACL, 
Um, that's the bulk of what's available. There were very few studies of human health effects um, from exposure to chemicals in the turf. Um, a few mutagenicity studies, some occupational studies, but, but not a lot. We'd have to go back to the rubber manufacturing literature um, to really see effects. Um, there have been exposure studies characterizing this very heterogeneous mixture of things that, that are associated with the turf and the chrome rubber. Um, obviously, we see a lot of potential um, agents here that have known health effects, um, but the levels that have been measured really haven't been super high. Um, there was one study looking at players and they measured their hydroxypyrene in their urine before and after they played on the field and so saw no change. Uh, there have been a couple of risk assessments done. Uh, one was a study in Italy which measured a lot of different fields and they estimated uh, that someone would have to play intensely for 30 years to uh, have an elevated risk of cancer based on be their benzopyrene exposure. The state of Connecticut did a risk assessment in 2011. Um, they didn't find any elevated health risks, but they did note that children could potentially be um, at higher risk um, because they're a little closer and particularly highlighted that indoor facilities had higher level than outdoor facilities of this mixture of chemicals. Um, and then we how that group from Cal EPA did a risk assessment in 2007 um, and we were specifically looking at ingestion, so risk from a one-time ingestion or just general hand-to-mouth in children. Um, where they have to be on the playground from ages 1 to 12, and um, so a slightly increased risk based on crises. Um, so as Scott laid out in his graph of how we prioritize different topics, after just looking at what was available in the literature, this sort of fell in that lower left blue quadrant. There's not a lot of evidence of high human exposure levels, and there's not even a lot of evidence of human health risks. There's, there's not a lot of studies. Um, but there wasn't sort of a red flag. So it, it fell in that blue quadrant, um, but then we got the request from OEHA to specifically test it. And their broader plan is a multi-pronged effort uh, within the state of California, and they're going to be measuring turf um, and as well as playground mats. So the recycled tire material is also embedded in those sort of solid cushioning that's under a lot of climbing equipment as well, um, and sometimes in mulch as well. But they're, they're looking at both of those, measuring them, um, doing targeted and untargeted testing, and they launched this last year, and they're hoping to be finished by 2018. Um, and one question they got a lot of is, has this been tested? And so that's why they sent us the letter. Um, they're going to be doing, considering aged fields, as well as new material, um, and doing swipe tests of the blades and stuff as well, um, as well as some biofluid extraction to see what comes off in different re reasonable conditions and some personal biomonitoring. So I've included the link there if you would like more information. I think that was in your background materials for the board. Um, there's also a, a federal effort from US EPA, CDC, ATSDR, and the Consumer Profe Protections um, Group. And this was uh, publicly released in February. Uh, and they're really trying to do so some similar things to the EPA group in terms of filling those data gaps that you know, we also found when we looked at the literature characterizing the constituents, identifying ways people might be exposed, can we narrow it down on one exposure route? Um, and they're, they're already had their public comment period, they're hoping to release some draft um, findings of this review in later 2016, um, they'll at least an update of where they are. And then just last week, um, the European Commission formally requested that the uh, chemi European Chemicals Agency look into this topic as well. Um, and so, also looking at identifying the substances within the turf, uh, they were focusing on PAHs, and assessing potential risks to people playing on the sports. Um, they're hoping that they'll um, be preliminarily done early next year and re release their results. So this is somewhat a crowded playing field, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, so what, lots of people are concerned about this topic. The public is concerned about this topic. It's on ESPN. So where does NTP fit and what can we provide um, to both work with our partners and, and help fill some of those uh, knowledge gaps? So we, we think our effort is unique and also complementary to these other efforts. Um, so our initial goal is to conduct short-term in vivo and in vitro toxicology studies on crumb rubber. So we're not trying to do the full turf right now. We're focusing on the rubber because that's what's of most concern. Um, but we have wanted our exposure scenarios to be as close to the human experience as we can do. So not 
push it to extremes with solvent extraction and, and getting to exposure scenarios that are vastly different from how people might be exposed. They'd like it in 18 months, and if you could do cancer while you're at it, that'd be great. <laughs> Obviously, this is a big task, but you know, there are some early biomarkers of cancer that we could look at in these kinds of studies. Um, this, these studies will not reach definitive hazard conclusions. We need to pick one test article, and we know that the fields vary geographically and which batch of tires you get. We got to pick one and so that all of our results can at least be compared, um, but hopefully by working with our partners, we can put that in context. Um, future work, I think, will we'll go a little farther in terms of identifying conditions, maybe dose, that are, are not associated with specific adverse effects. So we've started off, we've got some materials, some of the recycled chrome rubber that we're working with and looking at what comes off of it. Volatile chemicals, targeted analysis, um, some solvent extraction to see what we can get off if we push it to some extremes, um, as well as untargeted analysis, trying to quantify those that we can, um, looking at the distribution of particle sizes that comes off, uh, metals, and we're considering in the future doing also some of the artificial biofluids as well. Um, we need to really characterize our test material well so that we know how it fits into that landscape when all of the other agencies go and test all their fields. Um, we know what our profile of exposure looks like and can compare it. The next big hurdle is figuring out how to expose either animals or cells. Um, it's, it's not something we can dissolve in water. It's a chunk of material. Um, so we went back to think about considering multiple exposure routes. Um, obviously, we can do inhalation of particulate or volatiles. Just mixing it in the bedding with rodents. Uh, we don't know what they do with it, so we need to figure out whether it might cause some sort of veterinary concern, because these were relatively big chunks for the mice. Um, but we're considering it. Um, oral bioavailability study would be interesting to do. We're not exactly sure what we'd then look for in blood and urine, because we don't know what would get off. Um, one thing that was initially proposed was just, can you feed it to them and mix it into the feed? Um, and we're considering that, but have some concerns. Uh, I'll go into a little more detail. Um, so we think nose only inhalation is definitely a possibility that would get some of those volatiles and particulates maybe if we could get some more, more to come off in a controlled fashion. Um, whole body inhalation is possible. We'd at least get, um, we'd get some dermal do deposition of materials that would then could be ingested through grooming. Um, the feed concern, we, these are big chunks. We don't know if we could get a homogeneous mixture that they wouldn't just pick around the chunks. Um, and then those chunks are relatively big. We don't want to be finding physical problems of the chunks that aren't relevant to the humans. Um, even small children are considerably bigger. Um, we could include rodent models with specific toxicities, um, particularly cancer toxicities, um, but at least we'll start off with more just general wild type, type strains. Um, and initially, we just look across the board, major organ pathology, genotoxicity, gene expression analysis to see if we see any changes. In vitro, a similar issue, how do you get something to the cells? Um, right now in the lab, they're trying cold culture where they put the particles in the same media and small molecules can diffuse across a membrane. Um, but we, we're not sure how much or what would come off in that scenario. We could do extraction, but it, we're, again, we're hesitant to really push that far from the human condition, because we could get stuff to come off, but then how would we interpret the results? Um, or try to capture a particulate or filter and then expose it, expose it to the cells. Um, all possibilities now, we, we need to do a little more work to play with the material to see what's going to be feasible. Um, if we can get it to cell lines, then we can look at cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, gene expression as well. Um, we also would like to also include specific known constituents of the material as well as other compounds with known toxicities in order to put those results in perspective. Um, other things we're considering, uh, we, if we take the list of known identified constituents, we can look at what's available in public databases for in vitro studies um, of both constituents as well as their metabolites and see that might point us in a direction of some sort of pathway to look closer at in the, in the mice or other in vitro studies. Um, targeted testing based on preliminary results. We're really interested in what the aged material would look like, um, but it might make more sense to wait till the other agencies have completed their work uh, to see if that profile does in fact change and how. 
uh, we could use a variety of stem lines. And we could look at primary cells and look for transformation to car uh, cancer and, and see if that is a potential mechanism, um, as well as additional animal models. So particularly for this project, we're trying to keep in really regular contact with both OIHA, who made the primary request, as well as the other federal agencies. Um, we just had a phone call yesterday, and we're trying to figure out how, how we can best share our information to inform the other projects so that they don't go off in three different directions. Um, so we're having regular conference calls, getting an input, making sure we're thinking about how to share samples, if possible, um, and share data as well. We know there are a lot of academics who are interested and are starting to conduct some research. There hasn't been a, a whole lot of funding, at least we haven't identified it any by our agency, um, but we know this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in um, and are going to be start studying as well. Um, so, you know, if you look at the, the logos, I think NTP can provide that toxicological expertise that we have requested um, and, and provide that data to everyone in a transparent manner. So the next steps, obviously we're here today getting your input as the board, as well as public. I know we have a couple of public comments. Um, we'll be in continued coordination with those other partners, as well as the European group. We're um, trying to schedule a conference call right now with them. Uh, next steps will be to set project design teams for both the in vivo and in vitro initiatives and develop plans that would also be released. Um, this is the website Scott had a nice screenshot of it earlier, um, that where we will post um, future plans and updates. Um, we need to continue to try to characterize the material uh, and figure out what's going to be feasible, complete the study designs, and then we, we hope to start the in vivo and in vitro studies within the year. Again, these will be short-term studies, um, so 28 days. Um, and analysis of results and release the results next year is our aim. So as I mentioned, this was a big team effort. Um, I'd like to thank all of my fellow scientists at NTP, as well as and I, uh, Stephanie Holmgren, who's in the Office of Science Information Management, who is on our floor. We think of her as NTP, but technically not. But she, she helped with the literature search. I will take clarifying questions before the discussion. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from the BSC? Go ahead. Uh, Stephen Markowitz. Uh, is there anything in the literature uh, about the workers at the plants where these uh, old tires are used and cut up? Not that we found. Predominantly rubber, there's a lot of rubber manufacturing literature that does point to um, potential risks of cancer, um, blood cancer, brain cancer. Um, so more on the manufacturing side and not so much on the recycling side. Oh, okay. There actually is a Taiwanese study of workers in our tire shredding plant looking at volatiles, noise, they didn't do any exposure in the workers themselves, but there was some consideration of that, and it seems like a good idea. Okay, we didn't identify, identify yourself. That That's Jim Stevens. Sorry, Jim Stevens. I'm going to come ask you for that later. Thanks. So clearly there could be different kinds of exposures at different timing that's occurring. So when you're dealing with a newly laid down artificial turf indoors, you're going to be having a much higher volatile exposure than you would on anything outdoors or on anything aged. So I guess those are some of the things you're trying to think about, about the different kind of exposures. I mean, um, Yeah, they have found that the, the volatiles are definitely higher for the indoor facilities. What we really don't know how they might change over, over time, whether the volatiles will go down or stay the same or change. Yeah, I thought that there were, had been some studies d d done on that showing that they did the ch change with time. But the other thing is, is that a lot of the concern recently that has been certainly up in the New York Times and magazines has been the leukemias and lymphomas of soccer goalies, um, of female soccer goalies especially, that's been, Yet been brought up. That has not been published, and it's been in the lay press, but we haven't been able to get our hands on that data in any sort of pulled together um, format. So th yeah, that's definitely on everybody's mind. Um, Go ahead, Iris. Um, Iris Hugeson. Um You mentioned the roots of exposure, and obviously dermal uh, is the most obvious one, but these are people who are playing sports. Have you considered mucous membrane um, exposure, especially because the cancers of concern are leukemias, lymphomas? If the person was uh, a competitive athlete, and they had an injury, and they had abrasions, lacerations, um, um, 
um, fibers, uh, material in their eyes with the mucous membrane uh, exposure. So I'm wondering if you were, um, yeah, I, 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 you didn't have that in your slide. I'd like you to add that to your thought processes with the mucous membrane exposure, which is almost the same as a blood exposure, really. Yeah, and there, it's not a typical route that we look at, um, but particularly abrasion, and we did also think abrasions then opening up routes for infection as well. Um, and how would the chemicals maybe interact with that? Um, I, but, so that's different than the usual um, dermal, though, because dermal implies intact skin. And this yeah, exactly. Be... Yeah, and and we would not be trying to model that in um, in the in vivo studies. In vitro, we have some sort of lung tissue type things, but that wouldn't be the same thing as the eyes or or a, a broken skin, as well. Any other clarifying questions? Okay, we have um, some written comments. They come from Judd Larson, a private citizen, and Laura Green from um, Green Toxicology, LLC. Um, Laura Green, do you have oral comments you'd like to make? You've got about seven minutes. Okay, um, Dr. Boyles, Dr. Birnbaum, Dr. Peterson, and others, um, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I'm a consulting toxicologist in Massachusetts. Um, for many years now, various um, schools and towns and athletic boards have um, asked me about the safety of crumb rubber infill um, and other aspects of synthetic turf. Um, so I've thought about this for a while, and I've looked at the data for a long time. And I, I've submitted some written comments, which I won't bother reading um, out loud, of course. Um, I would love your thoughts on them at some point. Um, I'd like to react a little bit to what Dr. Boyle said. Um, and maybe give you some um, suggestions. Um, first, with regard to the cancer cluster, um, there are ongoing studies of this, and I would urge you to contact Dr. Kathy Wasserman. Um, she's the head of non-infectious um, epidemiology research at the Washington State Department of Health. And uh, her group is very actively investigating the question that Dr. Birnbaum brought up of whether there are or are not uh, increased incidences of lymphomas and leukemias among soccer players, especially among goalies. Um, my own sense as a toxicologist and exposure assessor is that um, there probably is a cluster, um, and it's probably never going to be explained. Um, and that's, um, as everyone in this room, I think, knows the experience of cluster epidemiologists when you're looking at uh, increased incidences, especially among um, young people, uh, young adults, um, leukemias and lymphoma clusters appear, and as um, scientists at the Centers for Disease Control tried for many decades, um, nothing ever seems to explain them other than random chance. Um, nonetheless, I'm thrilled that NTP um, has responded positively to California EPA's request to study this material, because when I have clients who come to me, they say the obvious, which is tires were not meant to be put into the general environment where little children might, uh, with hand-to-mouth behavior, uh, be ingesting little particles. And that's obviously true. I mean, tires are not a consumer product in the sense of being recycled in this way. On the other hand, recycling tires is a great idea. On the other hand, um, and I would urge you to include in your sort of group of experts someone from the tire industry, because rubber vulcanization is a very um, complex and, by the way, very closely guarded and patented um, process. And it's astonishing to me that no agency, as far as I can tell, has reached out to anyone at, I don't know, Bridgestone, Goodyear, the Rubber Manufacturers Association, because vulcanized rubber is a very specific thing. And if you think about it, it's obviously meant to be as inert as possible, right? It's got all kinds of antioxidants, cross-linking agents. I mean, tires are under, undergo a lot of weathering, obviously, by the time they get to the waste tire stage. So I would urge you to um, reach out to industry. I have a few ideas for you that I'd be happy to share at some point, um, because um, I've been trying for many years, just as a consultant, to learn more about tires, and it's not easy. Um, maybe the government will have more luck than I've had. OK, I want to talk a little bit about um, the prior research. Um, first, um, inhalation is not of interest. And the reason is uh, as follows. First, the mesh size that installers use is between 10 and 30 mesh which is between 2,000 microns in size, and the smallest is about 600 microns. So you just can't inhale the stuff. It's too big. 
uh, Lim and Walker, 2009, and in my comments I have about 15 citations to the literature, some of which of course you already know about. Lim and Walker, 2009, as part of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation study, looked specifically at an aged field, and Dr. Birnbaum is quite right that aged fields are very different from newly laid fields. Even in an aged field, they couldn't find any rubber particles that were smaller than 1,000 microns in diameter. So I think particle exposures are a non-issue. Um, with regard to volatilization, again, as Dr. Birnbaum mentioned, or perhaps you did, Dr. Boyles, indoor fields are the only place that there's going to be anything of potential significance. And as you know from Dr. Ginsburg's work, the only compound of even remotely interesting toxicologic properties was benzoethiazole, which was present at elevated le levels relative to background. Now, um, someone here is from FDA, and as you may know, benzothiazole is the moiety for a number of pharmaceuticals. Uh, so my guess is FDA has a lot of data on benzothiazole, maybe internal to it as confidential business information from drug makers, I don't know. Uh, benzothiazole is also an approved food additive. Apparently it imparts a meaty flavor, who knew? Um, and it's a high production volume chemical. So there's actually a fair amount of information. Again, some of it may be confidential business information, but my guess is there's already a lot known about the toxicity of benzothiazole or maybe benzothiazole derivatives that metabolize down to benzothiazole. Um, there are also papers actually looking at benzothiazole in people's urine. Um, but I don't think it's of interest for outdoor fields, A, because there's really no detectable above background, B, we're all inhaling benzothiazole entire debris. And one of the very interesting things I learned years ago is that about 5% of respirable particulate matter, so genuine PM10, about 5% of that is actually derived from tire debris. And so if you're a really good analytical chemist, as someone is in Italy, you can actually measure benzothiazole in ambient air from inhalable rubber debris. So that's pretty cool. Um, but it seems to me if you go through a simple exposure assessment, all of us are going to be exposed to a little bit from ambient air. The increment from crumb rubber in an outdoor field is in the, you know, less than a percent, and so I don't think particularly interesting. Um, I want to make an obvious suggestion for testing. Just suspend it in water and administer it by gavage. Um, I mean, that's the way you test dirt, for example. I wouldn't bother with aqueous extraction and biological fluids because you're going to have some false negatives. I certainly wouldn't do extraction with methylene chloride because then you're going to have some false positives. But it seems to me pretty straightforward. Um, and I really would urge you to not bother with chimney in vitro tests. None of them are going to be nearly as informative as just suspending some crumb rubber in water, uh, administering it by gavage, and then doing all the tests that you can do. Uh, as you know, you can do comet assays. I mean, you can look in vivo for in vivo genotoxicity. You can do gene expression analysis. Obviously, you can do all the histopathology and clinical chemistry. So although I think it's kind of cool <laughs> to think about in, uh, putting it in the bedding, you're never going to know what the dose is or the exposure. Or obviously, rodents do very different things from kids playing on synthetic turf fields. Okay, so the bedding it. is a cool idea, but I wouldn't do it. I'd do gavage. And I think very, very importantly, you should do more than one dose. I'm actually not worried about choosing you know, which field, because the truth is it's not as heterogeneous from field to field as you would expect, because there's like 20,000 tires per field. So it's kind of like, you know, the fields are more alike than you would think because they're all sort of mixed up in the shredding factory, in the recycling factory. I mean, the tires come from lots of places. Um, they tend to come only from North America, from the good factories, as it were. Um, and many of the installers specify car tires only because car tires are very different from truck tires in their physical and chemical properties. So that's what I would do. I would urge you to do three doses and gavage. And very importantly, especially if you're going to be looking at lots of endpoints like gene expression, um, I would do controls with horses are playing a lot. And it's all the female athletes who are benefiting from all these additional fields. Um, you know, when my girls grew up, they couldn't play home games because the boys were playing football and the fields were a mess afterwards. So the pressure for towns and cities and athletic departments to install fields is great. It's great from the feminist point of view. It's great from the public health point of view. But it's tremendously concerning to school boards when they hear about these cancer clusters and they do not know what to do. It's a really important concern. The synthetic turf fields provide tremendous opportunities, especially for young girls and young athletes of both sexes. And they're tremendously concerning. So I would do the gavage studies as quickly as I possibly could. 
but I would also do them with these so-called alternative infills because what's happening is towns are spending money they don't have to eschew crumb rubber because it has this black reputation and buy this expensive other stuff like coconut husks and Nike grind, which as the name suggests is ground up Nike, which seems to me is rubber Can also, you whatever. Can summari um, summarize and finish up? Oh, your sorry, own, your one own? minute? Less than one minute. Okay, so I guess those are my main points. Do gavage, do three doses, do dirt and other infills, and talk to someone in the rubber industry. And I'd be more than happy to help also because as, as I think a parent, I spend a lot of time working on this issue and would be delighted to help. And I'm thrilled that you guys are doing this work. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any other oral comments from the audience? Okay. Um, Dr. Genter, would you please present your comments? Sure. Mary Beth Genter, University of Cincinnati. So um, in terms of merit, it appears that there are a lot of stakeholders here, ranging from um, very engaged public and um, as well as the state of California. So I think the rationale for doing these studies is clear and valid. Um, I would think we need to really um, be careful with our vocabulary here and focus on um, if it's the tire crumb that we're interested in, let's just use that this standard vocabulary because artificial turf has many components, including you know the artificial grass blade. So I think it really is the tire crumb that we're um, interested in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of the approach and scope, um, there were lots of ideas presented by um, Dr. Boyles um, and other, others um, suggested by Dr. Green. And um, I think, you know, if you're going to have an 18-month turnaround doing um, various things, you, you, you do need to focus a bit. Um, in terms of the bedding or the um, mixing into the food, um, I think the dose is going to be difficult to determine. Um, Whereas with gavage and you know multiple dose levels, then um, that might be a bit more informative. I think something that's really really important to do is to um, you know if you do this oral um, study or even if you do the whole body exposure study and then um, you know allow for them to groom and they're going to orally ingest that um, as well. Um, to see what's bioavailable. I mean, what is it that's actually circulating in the blood? I mean, you can you can analyze the material itself in the lab, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what's going to become bioavailable and systemically available to the you know various tissues throughout the body. So, I realize that's tedious, tough chemistry, but I really think that that would be really informative to do. And I'm also hoping that you know, regardless of route of exposure, whether it's gavage or inhalation. Um, that you also build in um, um, genotoxicity assays, you know, micronuclei, comet assay, or, or whatever, because I think that'll be very informative, because I think part of the rationale for the state of California uh, requesting that you partner with them on this is that they were, they were worried about um, lymphohematopoietic cancers. So I think that would be a very um, important thing to do. <clears throat> Um, as you alluded to, um, Dr. Boyle, um, I think we probably need to have, you know, kind of a reference crumb sample, you know, similar to the Kentucky reference cigarette. I think we have, need to have a reference crumb sample that everyone is testing um, rather than having, um, you know, risking the variability um, that might or might not occur from um, batch to batch in terms of the material. So. That I think is important, especially if you're going to be um, doing experiments and partnering with others doing ex um, experiments in parallel, parallel, excuse me, so that you're all using the same material. And I also, um, <clears throat> I'm coming down on the side that I don't think it would be a waste of time or effort to do a limited amount of perhaps aqueous or this artificial, artificial sweat kind of um, extraction studies and look at in vitro um, and in, in vivo endpoints, excuse me, because um, that's how you might get at the dermal exposure. Um, you can't really do a dermal exposure study easily in rodents unless you're going to shave them and paint it on. And I don't think you want to get into that. But I do think that in perhaps a, a keratinocyte cell line, um, or even, you know, some, I'm, I'm not really conversant in, um, in you know, um, bone marrow derived um, perhaps stem cells even, that you might get some useful information from an aqueous or, you know, artificial um, sweat sort of um, um, study. 
Um, I think that's all I have in terms of the um, approach. In terms of public health impact, <clears throat> because this is a very, um, it's a, the, the public is excited, the public is concerned about this. So this kind of puts me in the moderate to the high range of enthusiasm, especially seeing how what you're proposing initially is not 10 years worth of testing. You're proposing a battery of short-term tests that might very well guide future studies, but you're not biting off this huge chunk of work. So because of the public concern, um, the concern of other um, agencies, um, and the fact that this is a small, doable chunk of work in a relatively short period of time, my, my, my enthusiasm is in the moderate to the high range. And I don't have any other comments, except that I thought your presentation was very put, well put together and um, easy to, to follow. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Jim Stevens, Eli Lilly. So there's a difference between responding to a public concern and the scientific aspects of how the problem is dealt with. So that, that's where most of my actual concerns came in. Um, it wasn't clear to me why the previous studies are being discounted because most of them came to the conclusion there was low, no, or negligible risk. So if those are flawed, it would have been nice to hear why we think those are flawed. Secondly, the study designed to do a 28-day study actually gave me a bit of trouble. It seems to me this would be better formulated as, or designed as an exposure study. If you gavage chrome rubber, what are you likely to measure circulating? Can you use it as a way to define what are the chemicals of risk via, excuse me, via that route? Because you're really not trying to test the solid. You're trying to test what comes off it. In that regard, how do you establish a dose-response relationship if you don't know what to measure? If you aren't measuring anything in exposure, how do you know if you gave 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams? And establishing a dose-response relationship is really critical to understanding how to do risk assessment. Um, there's actually a, a reasonable body of literature since crumb rubber is used in other kind of fill situations where they've looked at downstream aquatic toxicology outcomes. And, and I really liked that design. So for example, rather than using cell culture, why not use zebrafish and put an upstream crumb rubber canister? You could wash various different slightly acidic, not acidic, with and without UV irradiation prior to putting it in the canister, and then measure the impact on aquatic species in a closed system. So there is some limited information suggesting there are, I think they were termed as moderate or slight effects on daphnia. So that, that, that ecotoxicology approach as a surrogate for understanding what concentrations could at least yield a biological response, I thought was kind of compelling. Uh, there is a single study that I was able to find in Taiwanese workers working in a shredding plant. There was a lot of measurement of what are the particulates, what are the chemicals measurable in the air. Again, no exposure in the workers themselves. That could be really informative because you'd imagine that if you're worried about volatiles, that would be a situation as opposed to a soccer field where you'd have the maximum possible exposure. So a little bit of epidemiological work there seemed to be, to be worthwhile. Uh, so I guess where I ended up scientifically, I, I understand the importance of the issue. Where I ended up scientifically is worked out to get data that allows you to conclude something that really helps inform the concern. So for that reason, I came across as kind of low enthusiasm and low significance on this one. Thank you. Um, Dr. McMartin? Okay. Ken McMartin, uh, LSU Health Sciences Center. Um, I'm going to sort of um, float in the middle here between between these two. Um, change, seats. <laughs> yeah, change seats, yeah. Um, I think that there is a you know um, a relatively high public concern with this issue, and I I don't think there's really any data in terms of the potential toxicity of crumb rubber that's available that would help impact any decisions being made. So I, I, I agree that I think that, that um, pursuing a short-term in vivo and in vitro toxicity studies uh, would, be, would be valuable. I, I really like Jim's suggestion of the uh, downstream um, 
design into into zebrafish model. That would be a very interesting way to to look at this because it's what is coming off of the crumb rubber that's most important, I think. Um, you could make a suspension and gavage it, but I don't know whether you would get relevant information from that particular type of a study. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned, and this is one of the things that I, I don't think has been brought up, about doing any kind of um, uh, uh, surrogate marker uh, analysis of different chemicals that might be in the rubber, but we don't really know whether it's uh, they are uh, coming out so that people are actually being exposed. I know that, as mentioned in, in uh, Dr. Boyle's uh, talk, there's a lot of exposure studies that are being proposed. Anything that would be done, I think, with individual chemicals should wait until those exposure studies are, are complete. I think those detailed um, air monitoring and, and other type of monitoring studies um, are, are going to be producing, you know, probably extremely important information that, that uh, we could, it, you know, NTP could then follow up on. Um, I, I agree. I, I don't think any plans to do a solvent extraction would be uh, at all important because obviously people are being exposed on the field, maybe in the rain or from the sweat, something like that. So some type of water extraction might be a reasonable way to, uh, to assess how many, how, what types of chemicals might come off. Um, and just to address one kind of uh, aspect of the public comment, I don't think it's really reasonable to compare it to other fields because uh, I use the example, I wrote it down here, Louisiana soil is a lot different from Massachusetts soil. So I don't think doing any uh, type of comparison there is, is of importance. I think uh, just overall summary uh, rationale, I think for the study is fairly clear. Um, the approach, uh, focusing the approach, obviously, uh, you know, you alluded to that anyway in your presentation. I think a focused on that would be important. And I think although the data so far seem to suggest that exposure is minimal to nothing, I think that the public health concerns about, about this issue is, is really high. So that's why I kind of fall between uh, low impact and moderate to high impact. So I'd say moderate impact. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Sure. Um, yeah, so obviously lots to think about that. You know, that's one reason we brought this because we wanted some more heads to kick this around. And, and it sounds like you know, we're also not terribly optimistic that this is going to be the definitive study. And the, it is somewhat low potential, but it's a topic of high concern. Um, starting at the beginning, I guess. Um, yeah, we have struggled with the vocabulary. And every time we try to cut some of the words down, it's like, well, but then crumb rubber. This, you, people don't necessarily know where they come across crumb rubber, so we wanted to keep the turf in there. Um, the fact that it's from recycled tires um, is a little more clear what crumb rubber is. Um, so we, we have struggled. We will try to be more consistent and at least pick something and, and use it on everything the same way. Um, and, and struggled with this, what is bioavail bioavailable? Um, that's what a lot of the other agencies are doing. Um, in some ways, we're trying to do the tox study before we even know some of that, but we have been asked to do that to complement their work. Um, so yeah, in, in four years, I think we'll have a much better idea um, what is what we should be focusing on. The question is, do we do something short term now to respond to the request um, to try some of these and see if we can, can get something um, or have some sort of data as a starting point and then reconsider once we get some of those, those other things in. We would love to have a reference crumb sample. <laughs> the idea of, of, we did kick around some of the idea of trying to get some sort of sweat to, onto the cell, the aqueous extraction for the in vitro. Um, and we'll think further about that, as well as that aquatic tox approach. Um, we thought about a zebrafish, there is a, a zebrafish model of leukemia. And so we, I think we were just thinking in the potential health effect realm, not can we get a biological effect in something like Daphnia just to see if there's something active. Um, so we'll 
we'll think, I don't, I don't even know how we'd begin to do that, but it's fun, to, it'll be interesting to look into. Um, as well as some of the, the, I think some of the cell lines we're considering are um, all epithelial, whether it be it for keratin sites or lung epithelial. Um, and we'll appreciate your comments on the, um, not to do too much single chemical till we know what we're really looking at. Um, and yeah, the other comments on soil or, or other infills. Um, so appreciate your comments. Scott, do you have to, anything to add? Okay, are there other comments from the BSC? Go ahead. Uh, Stephen Markwitz. So I heard all three reviewers refer to uh, the public concern, and uh, I would just like to uh, offer a friendly amendment that it's not just the issue of high public concern. The public concern can be proportionate or disproportionate to the actual potential for exposure, but with 11,000 fields in play with another 1,200 per year being added, uh, the issue is not just public concern, the issue is the real, wide, the real opportunity for widespread potential exposure. I understand we got problems with exposure, but potential exposure. But that, it's, that the concern is matched by the opportunities, a widespread opportunity for potential exposure. And then secondly, uh, for anyone, I've been on these fields. If any of you have been on these fields, you know that you bring home the crumb rubber. It's inevitable. So it's not just on the fields, but actually you bring it into the home where it, it's hard to get rid of. Go ahead. I, I just want to be clear on one thing. I think the issue you raise is, is an important one, and there should be public concern about placing this much tonnage of recycled tire material, not just on playing fields, but in other fill situations. What I'm concerned about is whether this study provides anything that's informative to the necessary risk assessment that will be done on that particular issue. And I'm not certain, in fact, I'm actually rather skeptical that a 28-day gavage study in RAT is actually going to give you anything you can use to decrease the level of uncertainty, alleviate the concern, because absence of evidence is not going to be used as evidence of that. I guess I got that backwards, but you know what I mean. So I, you got to separate the two issues. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and to, to Please follow, identify uh, Norman Barlow, and to, to follow up on that uh, a little bit is, is, you know, one of the questions that I had noted was there's an awful lot of ongoing research and, and other things from other agencies, and while the NTP is being asked to kind of specifically deliver some, some data, you know, in the next 18 months, the, the question for me, and, and it's come out in several of these others, is, <clears throat> and to Jim's point about the study that would be conducted, is is this the right time to conduct studies and this is something that should mature a bit more, get a bit more data so that more definitive studies or more better uh, design studies or after the more specific chemicals that might be uh, of interest, whether they be volatiles or, or you know, within the actual crumb, uh, those better studies could be done at another time. So again, it comes to prioritization, what could be done now, the value of that data, and looking at, you know, the resources available to put to that. Okay, and in the respects of time, I really think we need, what, let me go, okay, go ahead. George Corcoran, Wayne State. Mine is a two sentence concurrence with Dr. Barlow and a number of the other comments that have been made, that this uh, is a fascinating topic it may be very important, but it's pr very, this is as premature as the proposals I've seen here in the last three years. So I, I would say hold until more definitive information comes from some of the other agencies where you can have a hypothesis driven set of studies and a conclusion could be delivered with some, some degree of uh, confidence in its outcome. I would just add, I, I also agree, sorry, this is Cindy Afshari. I, I guess I should disclose as the mother of a soccer goalie, I've had shoefuls of that stuff come into my house and so know what it looks like, but thinking about it with a toxicology hat, imagining making a gavage solution and how relevant that'll be to what my son was exposed to just really seems like apples and oranges. And so 
I just wanted to say as we think about what is the question and what's the concern, we think about the exposure, short-term duration on a field and what's actually getting ingested um, and, and how that's being exposed, I think came out, but I'm not sure 28-day traditional talk study is going to really mimic that. I like the idea of the aquatic surrogate. Um, that has a lot of interesting aspects to it. But I think if you do feel pressured to conduct some kind of study, again, thinking about those particles and what that gavage solution is going to be like, how it's going to you know, move through the, through the um, digestive tract of the rodent, you really are going to have to think about how you're going to control for particle stress and those types of things and what, what is going to be the control in that study. Okay, thank you. Can I just clarify, we didn't actually propose we were going to definitely do a Gavage study. We, the AB was laying out several options that we're thinking about. Uh, so we are struggling equally with how we might do this and add value. So just, I just want to clarify that. Okay, I, th I think we actually... Yeah, and I, and I would also agree. I really appreciated this discussion. And, and I, my uh, concern, or the driving factor that I see here that the NTP can contribute something to is the ex exposure, trying to understand what can, what can come off of these particles that can be absorbed. And, we're, and all of these discussions were very helpful in that respect. I was very interested, though, in the recommendation that several made that, that inhalation be taken off the table as a potential route. So if that's a, a view that's pretty universal, I think we'll take that back because that was really one of the one of the ideas that we were kind of really you know, putting higher in, on our list. I, I also want to thank especially Aris's comment about the mucous membranes and the exposure um, where a lot of the exposure to this on the playing field may actually be through abrasions and stuff like that, which will get stuff directly into the bloodstream, which is something, obviously, that a neural exposure is not going to happen. Okay, we are behind schedule. So I will um, briefly summarize. I think that there was a lot of varying opinions about the <clears throat> significance of this, but I think what came out of the discussion was that it's, it's a general sense of the...